Hey, Pastor Bobby here. I'm so glad you're joining us to hear what God is sharing with our community here at Chapel. And I pray, I am praying right now for you that this message will bless you. It'll be an inspiration to you. It will challenge you to be who God has called you to be and to do what God has called you to do. And so as we jump into the message, I pray that you open up your mind to God's word, open up your heart to God's spirit, and watch the two come together to bring a supernatural miracle in your life. So let's jump into what God is speaking to us right now. Two. Starting in verse 12, it says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. So one, that's a great point. I'm not even going to preach on that, but that's a great point. He's saying, when I was around you, you obeyed. But now that I'm away, I need you to obey still. What that means is there's a lot of people that will obey when there's people around that they know they should obey around. My kids obey a lot better when I'm around than when I'm not around. There's some people who obey and act godly at church, but in the absence of church people, they act like the world. He's saying, don't be like that. Obey more now that I'm absent. He says, work out. Everybody say, work out. Your own salvation, not the salvation of the person sitting next to you. Not the salvation of the person on Facebook. Not the salvation of the person at work. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in. Everybody say works in. Works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Everybody say work for. Work in, work out, work for. Work in, work out, work for. Work in, work out, work for. Father, we love you. And we thank you that you are a God who works within your people, that you allow for your presence to reside within your people, your power to work and bring to completion your work inside of us. But Father, we pray for the courage and the boldness to work out our salvation from the inner man to the outer man with fear and trembling so you receive all the pleasure and all the glory and all the honor that you're seeking to see displayed here on earth. And so, Father, we thank you, we bless you, open up our minds to your word, open up our hearts to your spirit, illuminate your word, bring it to life to us, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. <coughs> Great scripture. He even digs down a little bit more, says, do all things without grumbling or complaining, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God, without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. Crooked and twisted. In the midst means in the middle of. So you got to do these things in the middle of a crooked and twisted generation. Now, you may not know it or not, but the generation we live in is extremely crooked and twisted. It's extreme. There's a rhythm. There's a beat to the world that that the world is, is trying to get everybody to dance to that is extremely crooked and twisted. Just this week, you can see the world is, is, is a wicked place. There's a, there's a rhythm to it. That the, the world's trying to get everyone to dance to the same rhythm. And if you don't dance to the rhythm, then you'll start getting outcasted or judged or, or, or hated or bashed or offended. And they'll start outcasting you out because the world, which is darkness, hates it when the light shows up. Like when something is evil or something is bad, no one likes it when good shows up because it exposes that which is bad. And we live in a crooked generation. There's a beat of, of, of crookedness. One of the things, or one of the rhythms is, there's a rhythm of selfishness in our culture. Where it's about me, mine, what I get, what I want, what I can have, me, I want right now. And the world is trying to get everyone to dance to that beat. We can see it with the abortion debate. Despite what your political beliefs are. As a follower of Jesus in the kingdom of God, in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Our whole concept, you can read the scripture from beginning to end. God has a purpose and a plan for every single baby conceived. Not just delivered. Jeremiah, God knew him in his mother's womb. When Jesus was in his mother's womb, his cousin wept in his mama's belly. There's a purpose in plan. So it's not a matter of, of choice. It's a matter of life. Because here's the other side of it. We, we believe life is precious, 
On the other side, as followers of Jesus, we're not selfish people. It's not about what I want. It's not about my rights. If you read Romans 14, it's about moving your rights and your freedoms aside for the betterment of other people. Jesus cast his rights, cast his glory, cast his things to the side so that he could give us freedom. In the same way, despite your political beliefs, the world wants you to choose yourself over others. The kingdom of God cranks out this beat or this rhythm that wants you to choose others over self. And if you catch the rhythm that's going, it's not just abortion, it's everything. It's everything. The world wants you to choose what's best for you, and excuse my language, but basically say, the hell with everybody else. And that's the gospel that the world is preaching. As long as I'm good, I could care less if everybody else goes to hell. The gospel preaches this. I could care less what happens to me. I want everyone else to go to heaven. Paul said, I would count myself accursed. Accursed me. I would count myself, I would consider myself going to hell if my friends and my brothers and my fellow uh, Jews could make it to heaven. And so that's the rhythm of the world. Selfishness over selflessness. Then you see there's a rhythm of perversion where God has given us with sex and intimacy as a way to express love and transparency from one man to a woman. Well, the world takes that and perverts it so that then something that's good then produces shame and guilt and fear and worry and concern and brokenness and hopelessness and all these other things. And so, but the world keeps beating the same drum. The world keeps beating the same drum of perversion even though we know it doesn't produce life. And it's still trying to get everyone to keep on marching to that beat. So much so, Justin Bieber, of all people, the founder of the world's worst music in the world, <laughs> had a prophetic word spoken over his life when he was a young boy about the influence he would gain and how he'd use that influence for the kingdom of God. Got caught up in the rhythm of the world. The selfishness, the greed, the perversion. And finally came to a place where he realized, I'm empty. I've been dancing to this beat too long. And before he got married, he said, now I'm going to be celibate because I realize the perversion of the world has ruined my life. And see, some people in the world start realizing that the beat is not leading them to the promises. The beat of the world is not leading them to their dreams. The beat of the world is not lead, leading them to hope and to love and to confidence and to eternity. And it's almost like if you start dancing to a different beat, the world starts getting frustrated with you. The world starts kind of outcasting you. It's almost like if you remember the, the, the story of the Pied Piper way back in elementary school days. I, I was around a leader. And he's like, we just need a charismatic leader like the Pied Piper. He's like, the Pied Piper, he went through town and, and people started following him and, 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 and following after him. And We need a leader like that. And I remembered that story, and I remember that part of the story. But then I remembered the other part of that story where the Pied Piper was playing music, playing a beat, playing a rhythm. And he came through the town, and all the, first all the rats followed him out of town. And as he led them, he led them into the river where they drowned. Then he came back to town a couple months later. He started playing his rhythm again, playing his beat again. This time it wasn't the rats that followed him. It was the innocent kids and children of the city. And they began following him, and they followed the sound of the music, the rhythm of the beat, marching to the beat, where he led them all astray into their death. That is the world's purpose, is to get us following the music or the rhythm or the beat of the world to be led astray into our own destruction. And Paul in the scripture is saying, we have to be off beat. Daniel, in the book of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, or if you didn't grow up in church, it's Meshach, Shadrach, and a billy goat. It's <laughs> the only way you can explain it. What was it that they were supposed to do? They were living in a different country, 
And when they heard the music or the rhythm or the beat play, they were supposed to bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar. Meaning as long as you dance to the beat of the world, you're good. But if you dance off beat of the world, if you dance to the beat of the kingdom, we're going to get you. And in doing so, they were thrown into the fiery furnace, and even then, even then, they could not be stopped. Because when you dance to the beat, or you march to the beat of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God comes to support you in your march. So we live in a crooked and twisted generation. And in order to stand out, you have to work to dance off beat. Some of you may not have to dance off, work to dance off beat normally, but in the kingdom of God, your default is to dance like the world. Your default is to look like the world. Your default is to move or act or think like the world. You're going to have to work in order to dance off beat. And what that means is once you get saved, there's a work that happens where you have to start working. Salvation is the beginning, not the end. Touch your other neighbor and say, salvation is the beginning. That means once you get saved, it's up to you to start working on things and working things out. We call that sanctification. Meaning, you don't work for your salvation, you work from your salvation. Meaning, when you get saved, you're justified. Justification means your sins are taken care of, that you're saved, you're transformed. It's just as if you never sinned. That's what justification means. Big theological term for just as if you never sinned. Why? You're a new creation. You haven't sinned. That's your old person. This is your new person. But once you're justified, then there's a term called sanctification. Sanctification means once you get saved, you start allowing your outer man to be changed and transformed to look like your inner man. You let the outer person, your actions, your behaviors, your thoughts begin to reflect the inner man. There's a lot of people that get saved and justified that never look any different 20 years later. Does that mean they're not saved? We could probably have that debate. But what it means is they've never worked out their salvation. And there's three kind of views on sanctification that I believe affect us as believers. One, we believe God does all the work, I just get saved. Meaning, I say yes to Jesus, I don't have to do anything else, God does everything. And those people end up being carnal or lazy or lukewarm believers. They're, they're, they're people that are believers by confession, but their lives don't reflect the light that's on the inside of them. Or two, you have believers that believe it's, it's, it's all me, I do all the work, God finished his work at salvation, and then you have people that become legalists, they're full of, of effort and pursuit and, and, and struggle and anxiety. And my argument would be it's both and. God works and I work. God works and I work. Many things in Scripture that look like contradictions are not either or, but both and. God works on the inside and I work on the outside. It's like this week I got an email. I'm a member of Workout Anytime down the street. When I say I'm a member, that means I pay a fee every month and I drive by it every day. So one of the guys that's been coming to our church, he runs that gym. So the last Sunday he was like, oh, yeah, I work at the gym. I run the gym. I was like, man, I'm a member there. I don't go much, but I'm a member there. And so about Thursday I get an email from this guy on my personal email account, and it says, five times? Really? Five times in the last 18 months? I thought to myself, man, he's checking up on me. Like, I ain't checking up on your church attendance like that. Why are you checking up on my gym attendance? But you see, I, I'm a member of the gym. It's been paid for. I have access to it. The gym's done everything they're going to do. They turned on the lights, turned on the power, the equipment's clean, the equipment's set up. The gym has done its work. But I haven't quite done my work. And there's a lot of believers that God has done his work. He's, he's paid the price, he's paid the membership, 
He's given you access. He's given you power. He's turned on the lights. He's turned on the equipment. He's given you his word. He's given you his spirit. He's given you believers. He's given you a church. He's given you everything you need to work out your salvation. He's done his work, but there's a lot of believers who haven't quite done their work yet. And it's that work that lets you stand out as light in the darkness. So real quick. Number one, God works his salvation in you. In you. Everybody say works in. God works in you. Everything begins and ends with God. Everything. Your salvation begins with God and ends with God. But the part in the middle is usually your responsibility. God works in us. God does it work in my heart, in my spirit, and then I pull that out and deal with it in my flesh. The word works here is actually the same word for divine energy. The translation from the Greek to English, that word for work is actually energy. It's the word we use for energy. It means God works in us through divine power and divine energy. Through his spirit, he works on the inside of us. He works to bring those things to life that used to be dead. He works to bring those things that, that we thought were gone. He brings them back to our memory. He works on the inside of us to illuminate his word and bring things to pass. Here's what he says in Colossians chapter 1, verse 29. This is Paul speaking again. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy. Not Paul's energy, <coughs> but God's energy. That he powerfully works within me. I mean, I'm working through God's power inside of me. In Philippians 1, 6, Paul says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. So God is working. There's a divine power inside of you that as soon as you got saved, when God changed your heart and changed your spirit, he placed a power or the Holy Spirit inside of you to begin working things out on the inner man. He's taking care of everything spiritually, everything eternally inside of you. God is working on right now. Your hopes that you can't see physically, that are deep down inside of you, he's working on. Your fears that are deep down inside of you, he's working on you, trying to get those out. God is working inside of you even when you don't feel it. Even when you don't know it. Even when you can't see it. God is working on the inside of you. And whenever you lose sight of that, you'll stop working on the outside of you. The only way you'll maintain working on you is if you know God is working in you. And when you realize God is working in you, it'll motivate you to work on the outer you. Working in you. God is working. God is working in your kids. God is working in your spouse. God is working in your friends. God is working in every single person who claims the name of Jesus. God is working inside of them, even if you don't see it. That's why you got to be patient. That's why you got to be patient. That just because you don't see what God is doing doesn't mean God is not doing anything. Just because I don't see the seeds under the dirt doesn't mean they're not starting to germinate right now. Just because I don't see the roots under the dirt doesn't mean they're not starting to get rooted deeper and grow deeper before they sprout through the surface. That God is working in you. God is working in your family. God is working in your friends even when you don't see them. And that is the motivation. If I know God is working his part to motivate me to work my part. Number two, you have to work out. Work out the salvation God is working in you. you got to work it out. What that means is everything God does on the inside of you, he wants to get out of you. That God is transforming the inner man. But it's up to you to work that peace of your inner man. It's up to you to work that love of the inner man. It's up to you to work that faith of the inner man. It's up to you to work that salvation of the inner man out into your mind, into your behavior, into your actions, into your decisions. It's up to you to work out what's on the inside. That's what sanctification really is. It's, it's getting what God did on the inside out of you. That, that my spirit is renewed, now I need to renew my mind. My spirit is renewed, now I need to renew my, my thought life, my decisions. My, my, my spirit man is renewed, now I need to renew 
my decisions. And when you do that, then you start to stand out amongst the darkness. That word actually means to bring to completion. That I'm working out, I'm bringing to completion what God has already started. It's like a math problem. On a math problem, you don't just stop at the middle of the problem. You complete the problem or you work out the problem. It's also a word used in the Greek for harvest time. That you work out, you bring out the harvest from your field. Meaning you make sure you get it all up. But it really means, what they really use it for a lot in Greek, was for a silver mine. That people would buy a mine and they'd go in and they'd work out the silver from beneath the crust of the earth to bring it out. Meaning there's something valuable underneath there. There's something valuable underneath the soil. And I'm going to work it out to bring it so the world can experience what's on the inside on the outside. And sanctification is letting the world experience what God did on the inside of you on the outside of you. That there's a mine of silver and gold on the inside of you. Salvation is the most precious most precious commodity the world has ever experienced. And it's on the inside of you. And God in the scriptures telling Paul, I want you to work it out so the world can experience the light that's on the inside of you on the outside of you. Sanctification brings the light that God placed inside of you through his spirit to the outside of your life, to the outside in your marriage, to the outside to your family, to the outside of your job, to the outside of your mission. That there's something inside of you that God wants to get out of you, but God starts the light on the inside. It's up to you to work it out into the outside. You have to work out God's will instead of your will. God's will rests inside of you. God's will is sitting on the inside of you. But you have to work that out into your will. And the way you do that is through prayer. Prayer is not just a, a request that are given to God. Prayer is a wrestling of the wills. That when I go into prayer, I go into prayer, and don't judge me, I go into prayer wanting to tell God what he should do. Like, God, if you do this and this and this, it'll all work out. <laughs> but the longer I pray, the more... His will tends to come into my side, and my will tends to decrease. There's a will inside of you God wants to get out. It only comes through prayer. Number two, you have to work out God's ways instead of your ways. God's ways are inside of you, just like his will's inside of you. His ways, his character, his, his holiness, his righteousness is on the inside of you. And you have to work that out into your life through obedience. Working it out is part of being obedient to the standard that is already inside of you. So the world can see the change that's on the inside through your outside behavior. Then you have to work out God's glory instead of your pleasure. And that happens through suffering. No one likes to talk about suffering. But the older I get, the more I realize that there's more benefits in suffering than there is in comfort. The older I get, the more I realize there's more benefits and strength and power in suffering than there is in comfort and in peacetime. And what that means is, I think if everything God has in store for me is on the inside of me, all the peace, all the faith, all the hope, all the love, all the forgiveness, all the gifts are on the inside of me. Many times the only way God can get those things out of me is by breaking the outer man. It is by allowing me to be broken. And as I'm being broken, the things that are on the inside start to come out. And now that I've changed my mind in suffering that way, I realize when I'm suffering, this is a great opportunity. That I'm going through something because God believes there's something on the inside of me that people on the outside need. God believes there's something powerful on the inside of me that I can't get out of my own, that if I go through a breaking process and that process breaks me enough that maybe what's on the inside will get out into the world. Some things that I spent years trying to develop came out in a moment of suffering. Suffering is what allows the anointing to break forth. You can't have anointing without a breaking. And for leaders, I've moved to this place where I don't want a leader who's gifted. I want a leader who's broken. I don't want a pastor who's, who's, who's gifted or talented. I want a pastor who's been broken and suffered through some things because there's a greater anointing on the brokenness of a man than there is a gifting of a man. That wine of the anointing only comes out from a crushing of the grapes. 
And everybody wants the anointing, wants the power, wants the, wants the joy of the Lord. And what I've learned is that that wine comes out by being crushed by the world. Jesus was crushed by the world and that anointing that he had is still flowing into us today. And it only comes out through suffering. And that suffering, when you suffer well, the world will experience the pleasure and the glory of God. You've got to work it out. And then God is at work, number three, God is at work in me for his glory. God works for his glory. Contrary to popular belief, God is not working for your pleasure. God is not working for your comfort. God is working for his glory. God is working for his pleasure. And many times those two will not coincide together. Even this church at Philippi, there's a lot of things going on, a lot of oppression, a, a lot of persecution that's happening at this church in Philippi. And he tells them, listen, what you're going through, God is working for his glory and his pleasure, meaning your suffering may not just be because God is upset with you. It may be because God's trying to do something greater in and through you. And he says, I need you to, to suffer. I need you to realize that God is working for his pleasure and his glory in fear and trembling. What that means is, you should be so concerned, so concerned with this reverence of God that how I live my life either honors him or dishonors him. How I live my life either frustrates the will of God or completes the will of God. And I believe there's one thing that's missing in, in church as a whole. It's this holy fear of God. This, this fact that, yes, God is Father, God is love, but he's also a king. In the Chronicles of Narnia, they said, is he nice? He says, yes, he's nice, but he's not safe. I Meaning God is this holy God. And I should be afraid, I should be fearful that he's placed something inside of me. That I should be worried that I don't let that out. I should be concerned that I don't honor him correctly with my life. There should be a fear that I'm not trying to disappoint God who's given me everything. There should be a fear that, that I don't satisfy the joy, the will, and the pleasure of God with my life. And when God is working, God is working for his pleasure, I can either work with him or against him. I can either work for him or against him. But it does tell me that God has a purpose. That no matter what I'm going through, God is working in me. I'm trying to work something out. But God is working for something. God is working for a purpose. God is completing a purpose. God is working for a plan. You know what that tells me? That no matter what you're going through in this room, there is a purpose behind it. No matter what's happening in your life right now, there's a purpose behind it. It may not be a purpose of comfort, but it is a purpose of fulfillment. It may not be a purpose of, of, of joy for you, but ultimately it could be a purpose of destiny for God. See, what you're going through, though it may not feel right, no, no matter if it looks right, you have to know that God is working on the inside of you for a purpose to bring about for his pleasure and his goodwill. God is working. There's so many moments in my life where I thought life is falling apart, only to look back later and realize God was working something out much better, but there was a cycle or a season of pain and frustration and anxiety that I was working through, but God still had a purpose in my pain. And when you realize even in your pain, there is a purpose that God is trying to bring about to bring something better for his glory along. Many times we get so consumed with the pain, we forget his glory. In the same story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Nebuchadnezzar is trying to get them to dance to his beat. When I play my music, if you don't bow down, I'm going to throw you in a fiery furnace. I love the response. They say, oh, Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar. We're not going to bow down and worship you. We worship God and God alone. And even if you throw us in a fiery furnace, our God has the ability to help us escape. But even if he doesn't bring us out, we're still going to worship him anyway. Do you, do, you, do you hear the power in that statement? They're talking to the king of the world at this point. He brings them in and says, why are you not bowing down when I play the music? And they said, well, we worship God. They're like, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we worship God. He says, well, did you hear? I'll throw you in the fiery furnace. They said, oh, you can do that if you want to. But if you do, our God has the ability to rescue us. 
But even if he doesn't, we're still going to worship him. How many of you in this room, if God didn't give you what you wanted, would you still worship him? If God didn't satisfy your dreams or answer all your prayers, would you still worship him? Nebuchadnezzar gets mad. Crank the furnace up seven times hotter than normal. Which I did research on was about 1,800 degrees. So hot that the guards putting them into the furnace were burnt up and killed just by placing them in the furnace. They place them in the furnace. They're in their tunics, their robes, they're, they're, they're fully dressed. Nebuchadnezzar says, whoa, 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 I thought we put three people in that furnace. Like, yeah, sir, we did. We put three people in there. Shadrach, Meshach, and some guy named the Billy Goat was in there. He says, yeah, I thought we put three, but I see four. And the fourth man looks like the son of man, which is God. He says, get him out. Now, now, that'll tell you, one, that just because you're going through something and you can't see God doesn't mean God's not with you. God is working in you even when you don't see him. They were working it out. They were trusting God on the, on the inside. They are trusting it outwardly, standing out offbeat from the world. God worked in. They worked out. And then all of a sudden he says, bring them out. And I'm actually I'm going to read. It's such a powerful statement. If I can find my scripture. He says, did we not cast three men bound to the fire? They answered, said, true king, true O king. He answered, said, but I see four men walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the four looks like the Son of God. And he says, he calls them out, servants of the Most High God. Now, this guy was just making everybody worship him. He was casting them in the fire for worshiping God instead of him. Now he's calling them servants of what? The Most High God. Not a God, the Most High God. Then Nebuchadnezzar answered and said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and delivered his servants, who trusted in him and set aside the king's command and yielded up their bodies rather than serve and worship any god except their own god. Then, the last verse, Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. See, they thought the fire was about them. God knew the fire was about God. God was trying to bring bring about his glory and his will, so much so that they would be a light in the darkness, a light in the middle of a twisted and crooked generation. Nebuchadnezzar was twisted, he was crooked, and it was through the suffering of somebody else working out their salvation with fear and trembling that God could work out his purpose in Nebuchadnezzar, where now there's a man who is against God, is now worshiping God because of what they worked out in their own lives. When you come to an understanding that God is working in you, but you have a part to play in working out what he started, then God will work through you. God cannot work through you until he works in you, and God cannot work through you until you work out what he's already placed inside of you. And then and only then can we be lights in a crooked and twisted generation. You cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life if you're scared to stand out. You cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life if you keep dancing to the beat of the world's drum. You cannot fulfill God's purpose for your life if you're scared to dance off beat. Because the beat of the kingdom of God will always be in opposition to the beat of the world. Nebuchadnezzar will always be beating his drum. Greed will always be beating his drum. Selfishness will always be beating his drum. Perversion will always be beating his drum. And your natural default is to stay in line. But God is calling us to step out and start working at our salvation with fear and trembling so he can work his purposes in and through us into the world. If you would just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. Salvation is not the end, it is the beginning. And if you look exactly as you did now, as the day before you got saved, you haven't worked out what God has started. 
that God has placed something extremely valuable on the inside of you. Many times we ask God for peace. We ask God for hope. We ask God for joy. We ask God for, for strength. We ask God for power. And one of the problems with asking God for that is he's already given it to you. He's already worked it inside of you. But you haven't taken the time to work it out. To work out the peace of God into your mind. To work out the word of God that's in your heart. To work it out into your mind. To renew your mind. To work out the joy of the Lord that's in your spirit. To let it out through your life. That many of the things that you're asking God for, you already have. You just haven't worked it out and released it yet. You have to start digging in that silver mine and bring some things to the surface so the world can see how good your God has been to you. And then you'll start seeing his purpose, his plan, his ministry flow through you. For God will give you anything if he knows he can get it through you and it won't stop at you. Because we live in a world that is broken, a world that is crooked, a world that is twisted, and we have the light on the inside of us that needs to be shining to the world around us. And light always stands out. Father, I pray for boldness in this room. I don't pray for political boldness. I pray for spiritual boldness. Father, I pray for spiritual courage. Father, I pray for spiritual endurance. I pray for perseverance. That, Father, we know you've done your part. And as you're working on the inside of us, I pray that we'll work out everything. We'll strive, as Paul said, I toil in your power to work out what you've given me, what you've placed inside of me. I'll strive to let it come to the surface. Father, I pray for courage. That in a world that is trying to push your church back into the grave, a world that's trying to push your holiness back into a box, a world that's trying to push your presence back into a tabernacle. Father, I pray for boldness and for people that will stand up and stand out against a crooked generation. Father, not trying to cast condemnation, but trying to cast the light in the darkness, trying to show hope trying to show peace, trying to show love, trying to show holiness and righteousness and innocence and purity, trying to show selflessness instead of selfishness. And Father, I pray that your will be done in us, in me, and out of me on earth as it is in heaven. And so Father, we bless you, our God. Father, let us hear the beat of your kingdom in our hearts. Father, let us be marked by your presence. Father, let us flow to your rhythm, even if it means standing out from the beat of the world. So, Father, we bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I hope this message just inspired you and challenged you and blessed you. And if it has, I ask that you would partner with us financially so we can keep getting the word of God outside the walls of our church into the world. We want to see God's kingdom come. We want to see kingdom culture influence our worldly culture. We do that by God's word and God's spirit. And if you would like to, you can partner with us financially at wearechapel.org backslash give and you'll find everything you need to partner with us help us get the resources and the technology to make sure we keep doing this so we will see you next week hopefully you have a great week live out god's word apply god's word now and see god's best in your life be blessed